we're all frustrated because our, our standard here is high at Maryland. And um, the expectations were high coming into this season. On this edition of the Left Bench TV, we'll discuss Mark Turgeon's midseason departure from Maryland men's basketball and how the team fared in its first game under Danny Manning. An analysis into Maryland football's bowl qualifying season and a look around the Big Ten to see who is going bowling. Number eight Maryland women's basketball is on a two game win streak after falling to two top 10 teams down in the Bahamas. But they've got another top 10 matchup coming up on Sunday. And when it comes to diversity in Big Ten head coaching, how far has the conference come and how far does it have to go? The Left Bench TV starts now. Well, welcome back to Left Bench TV, your sideline source for all things Maryland sports. I'm Kevin McNulty. And I'm Katie Marr. With a bowl game on the horizon in New York and yet another top 10 matchup coming up for women's basketball, we've got a lot to get into. But we'll start today with the shocking news coming out of College Park on Friday afternoon. After 10 years at the helm of the Maryland men's basketball program, Mark Turgeon unexpectedly stepped down from his role as head coach. The move followed a disappointing 5-3 start to the season for the Terps, who began the year ranked 21st in the country. In a statement released on Friday, Turgeon said, quote, I have always preached that Maryland basketball is bigger than any one individual. My departure will enable a new voice to guide the team moving forward. Maryland basketball has been my passion and focus for the last 10 seasons, and I am extremely proud of what we have accomplished. Maryland Athletic Director Damon Evans added, quote, After a series of conversations with Coach Turgeon, we agreed that a coaching change was the best move for Coach Turgeon and for the Maryland men's basketball program. He has dedicated over a decade of his life to the University of Maryland and has coached with distinction and honor, end quote. Turgeon finished his tenure at Maryland with 226 wins, five NCAA tournament appearances, and a Big Ten regular season championship in 2020. First-year assistant Danny Manning was named interim head coach when the decision was announced on Friday. Maryland lost Turgeon's final game on the sideline Wednesday night against Virginia Tech, and he walked off the court to a chorus of boos and fire Turgeon chants after a tight 62-58 loss when the Terps only made one of 13 three-pointers on the night. The ill will from the Terrapin fan base may have fueled his departure about 36 hours later. Turgeon's players then had to pick up the pieces and take the floor again on Sunday in Danny Manning's debut as interim head coach. But Turgeon's departure didn't automatically erase Maryland's offensive struggles. The Terps hosted Northwestern for their Big Ten home opener, and though it was a close one for a majority of the game, the Wildcats secured a narrow win over an emotionally rocked Maryland team. Maryland's chemistry is still not fully clicking. Though the three-point shooting saw a bit of an improvement, they shot only 29% from the field, making 17 of 59 shots, which proved, which proved lethal in the 67-61 loss. Danny Manning went deep into the bench, even finding nine minutes of court time for Marcus Dockery when Ian Martinez went down with an injury. Martinez later came back to the court with some bandages on his head. Hakeem Hart led the way in the absence of much-needed scoring from Eric Ayala and Dante Scott. Hart had 18 points and seven boards, but didn't get enough help to grab Maryland's first conference win. Here's Danny Manning after the loss. Um, I came to Maryland because of him. I wanted to work alongside him and, and learn from him. Nobody wanted to win more than Turge. He won here at Maryland. He won in a tough conference, and he won a lot. I can't speak for him, um, but I know that our team will continue to follow the direction that his leadership provided for so many years. And, um, you know, that started today. I didn't expect to be in this position, um, but I'm ready to take on the responsibility of helping lead this team with the rest of our staff. I promised Turge and I promised Damon that I would do that, and I owe it to this team. And Chris Collins, who coached against Mark Turgeon as an assistant at Duke and later as the head man at Northwestern, had his own thoughts on Turgeon's tenure in College Park following his team's win on Sunday. What I'd like to say before we talk about is, you know, I hope Coach Turgeon is being celebrated for what he did here. You know, for 10 years, I've, uh, I've competed against that guy couple at Duke when I was an assistant and then you know eight years here in the Big Ten and I can tell you trying to prepare to play against his teams the kind of players he had here the winning uh, the way he did it the kind of person he is it's a good basketball coach and a good man so uh, I hope that everybody around here will celebrate him for his tenure as you guys move forward 
And it's been a shocking few days to say the least. So we thought we'd bring in our TLB men's basketball writers to dive into everything. This is a little segment we like to call the right bench. Noah, Logan, thanks for joining us. And, and guys, let's start with the timing of this departure, which is especially puzzling because the 56-year-old head coach signed a three-year extension in April that was supposed to keep him in College Park through 2026. And obviously now that's not the case eight games into this year after signing that extension. It seems odd. Yeah, absolutely. It was odd. I mean, five and three to start the year. Not the start that you wanted by any accounts, but it was just Noah actually broke the news to me on Friday, and conference play started on Sunday. It just really didn't make sense the way everything went down. Yeah, guys, the word that I've been hearing from people who have covered the team and people who have watched the team is shock. It's, it's unprecedented what we're seeing eight games into the season. We haven't even reached conference play, as Logan just said. So it's, it's been a, a tumultuous couple days uh, here in College Park. Yeah, Noah, when you say shock, I mean, that's exactly how I felt. Kevin called me, with, broke the news right when it happened, and we were just, we had no words for a while. We just kind of sat on the phone like, wow. Um, but I mean, let's talk about what led to this. It really goes to show how much external factors can go to affect a team, affect a player, what they see on social media, what they're hearing from boosters in the fan base. How much do you, think, how much do you guys think that affected this? Yeah, it, 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 makes, uh, it makes a big impact, as you can see. And obviously, I don't want to speak, neither of us want to speak for Coach Turgeon, but um, you could kind of see the writing on the wall after the George Mason game. Uh, the fans kind of completely turned their backs on Turgeon. You could see the boos and uh, the fire Turgeon chances you guys were talking about earlier at the, in the Virginia Tech game. So, uh, as I said, the writing is kind, was kind of on the wall for, for George Mason, but again, it's just it's, it's super shocking how just how much the, the fans kind of uh, impacted his decision to leave so early out of nowhere. Absolutely. I mean, those chants, they were actually right next to us in the arena when it started. And as much as we pretend that athletic directors, that head coaches, that they're just robots and they're machines, they're people too. So it obviously just plays a role, and I think that's what we saw play out. But at the same time, we're only less than two years removed from that 2020 Big Ten championship. Of course, they shared the title with Michigan State and Wisconsin, but that team was on its way to maybe a two seed in the NCAA tournament, and they never got the chance to make something happen. How does that season kind of impact where Turgeon's tenure went as head coach and how he'll be remembered here in College Park? Oh, it's, it's definitely a big, giant what if. I mean, if he would have had a tournament run to the Sweet 16, maybe even further, maybe things are different. And then last year, he took a team that didn't really have any business playing in the NCAA tournament and took them to the second round. But there was no fans there in the arenas to see it. So I think it was just all just bad timing on everything to make it just fall apart the way it did. Yeah, I completely agree with uh, what Logan said. Turgeon was dealt a bad hand. Um, he, I, I mean, with, with his, one of his best teams, if not his best team, um, not being able to show what they could do in the postseason. And then uh, last year, obviously, taking a team that, as you said, might ha not have any business being in the tournament, taking them all the way to the second round where they ran into an Alabama team that just could not miss a shot. So um, you got to feel for Turgeon a little bit, uh, obviously, with, with the, the hand he was dealt in terms of dealing with COVID and the, uh, the, the lost season, uh, the what-if season. And now yeah. this season, Danny Manning spends just eight games as Turgeon's assistant. Old friends played three seasons together at Kansas, had tremendous success there at, as Jayhawks, and now they were reunited for only eight games. Danny Manning takes over. We actually have a soundbite from uh, Danny Manning's introductory press conference back in April. Uh, we, I always knew Danny was going to be a great coach because of, you know, I played with him. I know how smart of a player he was. Um, and um, probably never thought this time would happen uh, that we had joined together. And let's, let me tell you some reasons why. And I know you guys are going to ask him a lot of questions today. Number one, uh, when you sit in a head coaching seat, it's, it's, it's a, there's a lot that comes with it. And whenever you can have a guy on your staff that's been through it, like Danny's been through it, Matt Brady's been through it, they, they, they can take a lot off my plate and can help me um, get through the good times and the tough times. Guys, it's weird to hear Coach Turgeon talking about what being a head coach means and having those assistants to help you out. That was Danny Manning. Now he's interim head coach. It's just a weird feeling. So now that Danny's taken this position, what does this mean for the near future, this season? What might this season look like? We kind of saw a preview of it on Sunday. And what does this look like long term? 
just quite frankly, looking at that team on Sunday, they look like a team that is lost and has no direction. And that was sort of a problem when Turgeon was still in charge of everything. They hadn't had a clear leader emerge yet. And right now, with all that's shaking up, that still hasn't happened. So to survive this season would be its own challenge. And then obviously the coaching search happens in the off season, but really just a program with not a clear direction right now. And I think one thing that we might, uh, we haven't really been able to talk about yet because of this big news of Turgeon leaving is that six of their nine rotation players are new, uh, new to the program, new to the rotation, and now they have a new head coach. So it's going to take some time. And uh, that's what a lot of people that have defended Turgeon have said is that, is that it, uh, it, it takes time. So. Now, guys, we've been flashing pictures this entire time of that 2020 Big Ten Championship team. It's weird to see. It was just a year and a half ago. Kind of nostalgic, shocking, to say the least. So thank you, two, for coming on and trying to dissect it with us. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks, guys. Appreciate you guys. Now standing at 5-4 and four on the season, the Terps will be back in action in Brooklyn on Sunday, taking on number 14 Florida at the Barclays Center. Be sure to catch the left bench's coverage from that game in New York as the struggling Maryland team looks to get it together before resuming conference play on January 3rd. Noah, Logan, thank you for being here and good luck the rest of the season. Now we've talked a lot about struggles with the men's team, but the eighth ranked Maryland women's team is finding some more success early on in the season. After finding themselves in some hot water thanks to player illnesses and falling to two top 10 opponents in the Bahar Mar Hoops tournament over Thanksgiving break, Brenda Frieza's squad has regained control and is fresh off two big wins. First up was the Big Ten ACC Challenge against Miami on Thursday, and the Terps took the Hurricanes by storm. The matchup was heated with Miami's Kelsey Marshall and Maryland's Angel Reese racking up the stat sheet. Marshall earned 24 points for her team while Reese grabbed a career high with 26 points and 15 rebounds, making her fifth double-double of the season. Miami couldn't stop Ashley Owusu as she went 12 for 14 in free throws. Although the game was neck and neck the whole time, the Terps climbed up the scoreboard in the fourth quarter and took home the 82-74 win. On Sunday, the Terps officially entered Big Ten play, and they're bringing a 73-59 win over Rutgers back to College Park. Angel Reese continued to dominate out on the court, leading the way with 18 points and six boards. The Terps had four players score in double figures and forced 19 turnovers. This team just continues to prove its depth this season. Here's head coach Brenda Freeze after that road win. You know, we're, you know, excited to be able to get our first win in conference, you know, to, to start conference play. Um, we were fortunate to, to be able to come out with the win. I thought, um, you know, um, made some big plays. You know, we were led by these guys up here. I thought they were um, really competitive, really aggressive. I thought Shy grew up as a freshman, uh, made some big uh, plays for us, you know, down the stretch in the fourth quarter. Um, but a lot of areas for us to continue to keep growing and, and improving. I love the fact that we got to the free throw line 27 times. I think we do a good job um, being able to, to get, get to the free throw line. But, um, you know, every game is going to be this competitive in league. The Terps will host Purdue for their Big Ten home opener on Wednesday night. After that, they'll head over to Columbia to face off against number one, South Carolina. The last time these two met was in 2019, where the Terps fell by nine points. But hey, it's been two years, and this time around, these are two very different teams. There was some exciting news coming from the Xfinity Center Pavilion on Saturday. Maryland Wrestling won, and not only that, they won two matches in the same day. The Terps hosted Drexel in the first of two duels on Saturday, and they broke their 23-match losing streak in the process, defeating the Dragons 21-19. A late comeback featuring standout performances from Kyle Cochran, Jaron Smith, and Zach Schrader turned out to be the deciding factor as the Terps collected their first duel victory since January of 2020. But the Terps didn't stop there. They hosted Duke for the second match of the day, and we know there's nothing Maryland fans love more than beating Duke, no matter what sport it is. Following the win against Drexel, Alex Clemson's guys were back looking for back-to-back -back dual wins for the first time since 2017. Cochran, Smith, and Schrader all won each of the last three matches, with Schrader winning the final heavyweight match thanks to a takedown in overtime which secured the victory for the Terps. Maryland will be back on the mat Saturday, hosting Navy at 6 p.m. Be sure to catch our own Matthew Weinsheimer's coverage as the Terps attempt to stay in the win column. And when we come back, we'll have a recap of Maryland football's bowl qualifying year and a look around the Big Ten to see who's going where during bowl season. 
Then, as always, your top five plays, Pro Terp and Terp of the Week. Don't go anywhere. The black truck. Hey, Christina from accounting. Yeah, hi. <laughs> hey, I used to date a girl named Christina. Oh, really? Yeah, and then she dumped me for my best friend. You want to see some photos of them that I took? I don't. I thought we talked about this, buddy. Buzz and overshared again? Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to call a car. That's a smart idea. So yeah, I know. That's why I did it. Hey, you're going to get back to the top of the mountain. Does that mean I'm going to get back with Christina? No. Oh. No, no. Welcome back inside Studio A here at the University of Maryland. You're watching The Left Bench TV. And it is official. Maryland football is headed to the new era pinstripe bowl at Yankee Stadium. That's right. The 6-6 six and six Terps have qualified for their first bowl game since 2016. And they'll be taking on the 6-6 six and six Virginia Tech Hokies on December 29th. Like Kevin said, this is Maryland's first time being bowl eligible in a hot minute. So we thought we'd look back at everything that got the team to this point. The good, the bad, and the ugly. First up, all teams deal with them, but injuries were a big storyline for Maryland throughout the course of the season. Yeah, I mean, this is a team that was overwhelmed with injuries. As we know all too well, they lost their star wide receiver, Dante Demas Jr., in week five, and this was supposed to be his NFL showcase year. And I mean, Demas' injury took the life out of Maryland in its Big Ten home opener against Iowa. And it was the very next week at Ohio State that senior receiver Jay Sean Jones, who was supposed to be the next man up after Dante Demas got hurt, he was sidelined for the remainder of the year as well with an apparent lower leg injury. Jones wasn't even the last member of that Terps receiving core to catch the injury bug. As redshirt freshman Marcus Fleming went down later in the season for good, he got hurt against Michigan State. That kind of took the life out the receiver room completely. All they had left was Carlos Carrier at that point and a few other guys, Corey Deitches. That's kind of a tight end though. Right, and Katie, those injuries kind of hit at the worst time for Maryland as they were starting conference play against a pair of top 10 teams in Iowa. They got beat bad at home on Friday night. That was not very fun, was it? That was not fun. I was there covering it, and it was unpleasant. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> and then it was the next week they were going to a top 10 team in Ohio State, and that's when Jason Jones went down. So it was a pair yeah. of three-game losing streaks for Maryland that they were over able to overcome, though, because yeah. they had games against Indiana and then later Rutgers in the finale of yeah. the season. And we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about the unbelievable schedule that Maryland was forced to play as a member of the Big Ten East. The Terps were 6-2 and two against teams outside of the top 10. And those four games inside the top 10, Iowa, Ohio State, Michigan State, and Michigan, well, they didn't go very well. They lost by an average of 36 points. But... That didn't stop Maryland from coming out and beating Rutgers last weekend, as we saw, to get that sixth win. And Maryland took care of business in non-conference play, 3-0. Remember the season opener against West Virginia? Well, they played really well in a game in a, against a team that's going to a bowl game against Minnesota, who finished 8-4. Absolutely. I remember seeing a tweet after, I believe it was the Kent State game, when Maryland was kind of opening up, opening up that whole Big Ten slate. They had one of the top three, I think, strongest remaining schedules in the country at that point. They weren't dealt the kindest hand, basically, for the rest of the season. So for what they were able to pull together with a really depleted force, like we talked about with all the injuries, they really, honestly, they pulled it together this year. Coach Loxley really pulled it together for them. And, and Katie, why is that? Maybe because of the quarterback that so they Leah have. So Leah Tungavailoa, he did amazing this, this season. He broke two records. He broke the record for most completions in a season and passing yards in a season. He had, I believe... 3,600 passing yards, and he had 308 completions on the season. Only 11 interceptions, maybe not the prettiest statistic, but all things considered, he had 24 touchdowns. So he really led them out of a depleted receiver room. He really brought them through it. And don't be deceived by that 11 interception stat because five of them came against Iowa in that, that kind of true. throwaway game that we had in College Park in early October. So six interceptions outside of that, 24 touchdowns. Talia had himself a season and he has a couple more years of eligibility. He really did. And remember, he was in Heisman talks at the beginning of the season. Let's not forget that, guys. And Tonga Vailoa is going to have another game to add to those stats, isn't he? He does get another game. They're going to the pinstripe bowl. Here's Mike Loxley on how excited those guys are for that. Um, obviously, for me, the big, the big thing that comes out of this game is the opportunity to continue to develop our program uh, with the practices that we'll be able to have here in the next few weeks uh, as we prepare for uh, our game against Virginia Tech. 
happen. I know our players are excited about it. Uh, I'm excited. Our coaches are um, as we uh, embark on the next few weeks of developing our program while also giving our seniors a chance to, to go out the right way. Um, the goal is obviously to get to a bowl game, but the goal is also to win. And, you know, we, we're going to use these next few weeks to do everything we can to prepare our team to win while also developing our program uh, as we take the next step into what I feel is our 22 season. But Locks, Maryland isn't the only team going to a bowl game this winter. No, they're not, Kevin. TLB's Nathan Schwartz joins us in the studio to go around the Big Ten and tell us who is going where and who got left behind. Nathan? Yeah, guys, the Big Ten proved once again why they are one of the most dominant conferences conferences in all of college football as they had nine of 14 teams from the conference make a bowl game this year. And we're going to catch you guys up on all those bowl games. So let's get right to it. We'll start out focusing with on the Big Ten Championship, which featured the Michigan Wolverines and the Iowa Hawkeyes. Iowa came into this one looking to pull off a major upset representing the Big Ten West, which has never won the Big Ten title since the conference was divided in 2014. Michigan's offense was clicking on all cylinders throughout the entire contest as Cade McNamara and Hassan Haskins led the charge for Michigan once again. Defensively, Aiden Hutchinson was all over the place, collecting a sack and four tackles, which earned him MVP honors for the game. This one-handed grab late in the fourth quarter by tight end Eric All sealed the 42-3 victory for the Wolverines as they won the Big Ten Championship for the first time since 2004. Number two Michigan will now shift their attention to the college football playoff semifinal as they square off against number three Georgia, who's coming off a loss to Alabama in the SEC championship game. Georgia has been the top dog of college football all season long, so this game will be the toughest test the Wolverines have had all year. The winner between Michigan and Georgia will face the winner of Cincinnati and Alabama in the national championship. For Iowa, on the other hand, even though things may not have gone their way in the Big Ten Championship, the loss only dropped them one spot in the rankings, going from 14th to 15th. The Hawkeyes will get a chance to bounce back and collect their fourth consecutive bowl victory as they will travel to Orlando, Florida to face Kentucky in the Verbo Citrus Bowl on New Year's Day. Now one other Big Ten team that nearly snuck into the playoff, and that team was the Ohio State Buckeyes. The last time we saw the Buckeyes in action was on November 27th in a loss against Michigan. But due to a loss by Oklahoma State in the Big 12 Championship, Ohio State jumped the sixth in the, in the final college football playoff rankings and will take part in college football's most iconic bowl. The Buckeyes will take a trip out west to Pasadena to play in the Rose Bowl against the 11th ranked Utah Utes. The Utes are coming off a massive victory over Oregon in the Pac-12 Championship and with both teams scoring over 35 points per game, don't be surprised if this one turns into a shootout. Michigan State exceeded all expectations this season, as running back Kenneth Walker III led the Spartans to a 10-2 record, good enough for third place in the Big Ten East. Michigan State beat Penn State in their regular season finale, and sitting at 10 in the rankings, they will compete in one of the more recognizable bowls, the Chick-fil-A Peach Bowl. The Spartans will take on Kenny Pickett and the Pitt Panthers, who won the ACC Championship on Saturday. Pickett will likely be a first-round pick in the upcoming 2022 NFL Draft, so the Spartans will have to lock in defensively to keep Pickett in check. The Big Ten team with probably the most underwhelming season so far due to expectations has been the Penn State Nittany Lions. They lost five games for the first time since 2015 and heads into their bowl game unranked. The Nittany Lions have shined at moments this year and will look to give their star wide receiver Jahan Dotson the ball a lot more in the Outback Bowl against Arkansas. Dotson established himself as one of the best athletes in the whole nation this year, so don't be surprised if he has a big game against the Razorbacks. Speaking of expectations, Purdue didn't have many coming into the season, but the Boilermakers shocked everybody as they upset both Iowa and Michigan State en route to an 8-4 record. It is Purdue's best season since 2007 when they also won eight games, and they will head to Nashville to take on the Tennessee Volunteers in the TransPerfect Music City Bowl. Two more Big Ten teams earned bids to go bowling, and their matchup in the last week of the regular season played a pivotal role in the bowl they got invited to. Wisconsin and Minnesota squared off in the Minneapolis on November 27th, and the Golden Gophers upset the Badgers, ending their chances to play in the Big Ten Championship. Wisconsin was ultimately invited to play in the SRS Distribution Las Vegas Bowl against Arizona State. Be sure to keep an eye out for Wisconsin's star freshman running back Braylon Allen in that matchup. As for Minnesota, their win over Wisconsin was their eighth of the season, and they get to escape the cold weather as they will face West Virginia in the Guaranteed Rate Bowl, which takes place in Phoenix, Arizona. 
Now, there are five Big Ten teams that finished with less than six wins and will not be competing in bowl games. So let's take a look at the bottom of the Big Ten standings. In the Big Ten East, Rutgers lost to Maryland in the final game of the regular season ended their chances at a bowl, and Indiana finished with the season without a conference win, mainly due to injuries. In the Big Ten West, Illinois had an upset win over Penn State earlier in the season, but they finished a game shy of bowl eligibility, just like Rutgers. Nebraska finished 3-9, and nine, but to their credit, were a part of eight games that were decided by one possession. And Northwestern also finished 3-9 and nine with their singular conference win coming against Rutgers. Now guys, with how competitive the Big Ten was this year, it wouldn't surprise me if a majority of these teams win their bowl games, especially Michigan in that college football semifinal against Georgia. Absolutely. I'm excited to see all those. I love football season, so any excuse for me to watch more football in the winter, I'll take it. Well, that Big Ten championship game was a ton of fun, even though it was kind of a blowout with Michigan yeah. leading the way, but exciting to see them in the college football playoff. Thank you, Nathan. Thanks. Of course. Though it's not headed to the postseason, Maryland volleyball saw a season much unlike 2020. The Terps had an overall record of 19 and 13 going undefeated against non-conference opponents and 7 and 13 in the Big Ten, an improvement from their 5 and 15 conference record in 2020. Raynell Jones was named first team all Big Ten and was the first Terp to lead the NCAA in any statistical category. She averaged 1.73 blocks per set, the best in Division I. Jones is also the fourth player in program history to record 500 career blocks. And she wasn't the only Terp to be honored by the Big Ten, as standout libero Milan Gamillion was named to the all-freshman team. Her 495 digs this season are eighth most by a Terp in a season. And now let's go back to basketball for a minute. Last Wednesday's Big Ten ACC Challenge matchup against Virginia Tech may be remembered as the final game of the Mark Turgeon era, but it was also a very special night for a Maryland legend. It was, and that legend, the late Len Bias. The program honored Bias during the game, and they gave out 4,000 free jerseys to students to commemorate him after his induction into the College Basketball Hall of Fame on November 21st. TLB's Stephen Mailing has the story. People think Maryland, they think Len Bias. Imagine having a legacy that sums up a program. That is what Len Bias means to the University of Maryland. Students knew of him before they even set foot on campus. I looked up to him before I came to the school and coming here seeing these jerseys tonight. It's just a special night. I hope the team performs. Bias died back in 1986, just two days after being taken second in the NBA draft by the Boston Celtics. His death shocked the world. He had um, the world grieving with us when this great athlete uh, passed. It was a dang shame that his career had to end that early, but man, when he was here, he made some big changes to this program. Pretty evident that Len Bias' legacy continues to be present here in College Park. And although he hasn't hit the court since 1986, his parents remain moved at how much of an impact he's had on both young and old. It's been sad seeing the sea of... Uh, jerseys out there and the young people cheering and jumping up and down and then when we were passing through the crowd people touching us and thanking us and I understand that when we grieved as I said earlier for Len there were so so many people that grieved and there are people that are still grieving over his death. Being here just shows that Len Bias's legacy has just been living on for this long. And will continue living on for years, if not generations. Life of Len still goes on. The legacy lives. Mm -hmm. but not only does it live through them, it lives through my grandchildren. And our thanks to Stephen. Katie, this summer I worked on a 15-part podcast series that explores the life of and death of Len Bias, so catch that wherever you get your podcasts. I'm excited to listen to it. I love a podcast. And when we come back, we'll have your top five plays, Terp of the Week and Pro Terp. And I was able to speak with Big Ten Commissioner Kevin Warren, Head Coach Mike Loxley, and Wisconsin women's basketball coach Marissa Mosley about diversity in Big Ten head coaching, how far they've come, and how far they have to go. Stay tuned. There you go. 
Thank you. Thank you. And for everything that happened off the court this week, believe it or not, there were moments on the court that qualified for our top five plays. And we had plenty to choose from, but there can only be five. So let's get started. Starting with number five, it's Julian Reese there to clean up after Fats Russell with the two-handed slam against Virginia Tech. Of course, Maryland went on to lose that one, but Reese has been a weapon off the bench thus far. He really has. Next up, his sister, number four, Angel Reese shaking her defender on the fast break last Thursday. Where are you going, ma'am? Reese banks it in for two of her 26 points. At number three, it's Kyle Cochran sweeping his left leg to take down his opponent in the 184-pound weight class. Cochran won both of his bouts on Saturday, helping the Terps to their sweep over Drexel and Duke. Let's watch that again in slow-mo. Oh, yeah. Now for number two, check out Hakeem Hart knocking down the three from the top of the key off an assist from Caduce Wahab. Hart was fired up, clearly. Sadly, his 18 points were enough to get Maryland that dub as they fell to the Wildcats by six. But watch again in slow-mo. We love slow-mo. And finally, our top play of the week, Faith Masson is back from missing time with illness. She receives a pass from Cheyenne Sellers and knocks it down for two. Let's watch that one again. Both Masonis and Katie Benzen came up big for the Terps in the return on Thursday. And for the second time in a row, Angel Reese is your Terp of the week. The sophomore started this season with a lot to prove, and while I think she's proved herself, I don't know about you, Kevin, but over Maryland's last two games, Reese has combined for 44 points and 21 rebounds, making her a lock for our nomination once again. Congrats to Angel. Now, if you thought our pro turp would come from the NFL or the NBA, you'd be wrong because this week we're looking toward the NLL, the National Lacrosse League, where former men's lacrosse star Matt Rambo has been doing Matt Rambo things. Take a look as Rambo nets the overtime game winner for the Philadelphia Wings in their season opener on Saturday. Maryland's second all-time leading scorer finished the game with three goals and three assists, accounting for half of his team's goals. That guy is as smooth as silk. Now, diversity is an uphill battle. That is no secret. And it's a battle that the Power Five conferences are making strides in. But I wanted to dive deeper into just how big those strides are and how diverse the Big Ten's head coaching positions are, especially in women's sports and sports dominated by black athletes. I was able to talk to Commissioner Kevin Warren, Maryland football's Mike Loxley, and Wisconsin women's basketball head coach Marissa Mosley to hear their stories and, and their takes on how the conference is doing with diversity. And I feel honored um, that I get this opportunity to kind of step into a really coveted role. And on the other hand, it's, um, it's disappointing that there aren't more uh, women of color who have either gotten the opportunities um, or, who are, or who are, you know, in these roles um, for a long, sustained period of time. In 2021, the Big Ten filled all three of its open head coaching positions in basketball with people of color. Wisconsin women's basketball head coach Marissa Mosley was one of those hires, and she recognizes the value of young female athletes having a black female head coach to look up to. You can't be what you can't access, right? And so even if you can see it, it's almost worse if you can see it and you can't access it. So I think for, for you know, young women of color to see me in this position to not only know it's possible, but that I can also tell them how you can go about doing that. It's no secret basketball is a diverse sport at the playing level. Out of 28 head coaches in Big Ten basketball, 12 are women, two of whom are black, and four are black men. In comparison to the other Power Five conferences, the ACC has the Big Ten beat with five black male basketball coaches, and the Big Ten falls in third place with black female head basketball coaches behind the SEC's five and the ACC's four. However, the Big Ten's 12 female head basketball coaches is the most in the Power Five. Basketball isn't the only black-dominated sport with a disparity in its coaching numbers. The University of Maryland is home to coach Mike Loxley, who is one of three black head football coaches in the Big Ten. I think what it means to me is that the Big Ten obviously is at the forefront, if not at least one of the, the conferences that it's important to them to have diversity. While Coach Loxley can't speak for his players, he knows he brings something different to the table when he's recruiting young black men to join his program. I do know when I sit on people's couch and some of the players with, as we found through the coalition that I started, you know, 65% of the 
football players at the FBS le level are, are minority uh, football players and that the representation of coaches is only around 13 percent that there is a unique perspective that I bring when I go into a home because a lot of these homes are a lot like the, the home I grew up in. When asked if he thinks the lack in diversity in head coaching plays a role in black student athletes choosing an HBCU over a Power 5 school, Big Ten Commissioner Kevin Warren said he thinks the diversity is strong. I think because the Big Ten, you know, is the Big Ten and, and, uh, and we do have, you know, strong diversity in our coaching ranks. I mean, we all can, can do better and, and we're focused on doing better, we, you know, which we will. I think at the end of the day, you know, our student athletes want, want to make sure that they play uh, for coaches who can just help them to get better, you know, one as a person first and secondly as a student athlete. Often the lack in diversity at the head coaching level is simply due to the lack of turnover, which lagged prior to 2019. But one important question to ask, who is making these decisions? And is there diversity in those positions? The Big Ten has three black and five female presidents and chancellors and five black athletic directors. That's the most of any Power Five conference. Though diversity is a journey where most in college athletics have not reached the destination, strides are being made. And coaches like Coach Mosley and Loxley want the kids looking up to them to know they have someone in their corner. Just dream big, you know. Uh, on the day I got into coaching, I dreamed that I would one day lead Maryland. And it's never going to be easy and that you just got to continue to dream big and work toward achieving those dreams. And when you do have a chance to, to reach them, pay it forward by reaching back and giving back. You can truly be anything that you set your mind to. If you don't see it, then go and, and make yourself that first so that other young women can see that it's possible. You know, Kevin, I love being able to talk to Coach Mosley, Coach Loxley, Commissioner Warren, and just want to thank everyone for helping me put that together, get those interviews together, and thank them for their time. It was great to hear their insights. They're all great people and so deserving of their positions. Well, it's good to see that the conference has made at least a little bit of progress in the past yeah. year or so. Now we have an African-American head coach in the basketball uh, position here at this university. We'll see if it stays that way in the spring. Yeah, now. obviously interim and I was doing full time, but you never, never know what's going to happen. We'll see where it goes. And that does it for this edition of the Left Bench TV. And it happens to be our last of the fall semester. We'll be back at the desk in February. In the meantime, be sure to check out all of our coverage on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at the Left Bench. We'd like to wish you and yours a very happy holidays, and we hope everyone has a safe and healthy time enjoying your favorite holiday food. Personally, mine is mashed potatoes and peanut butter Christmas cookies. What about you, Kevin? Well, those peanut butter Christmas cookies are really good, but I don't like when the crumbs get all your, over your face. I'm yeah, trying to grow out my mustache uh, over the break, so we'll see how that goes. Yeah, I'm excited to see it in February. I guess you guys will see it in February. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time.